So we've got a terrific panel to, uh, to discuss this, and I'll introduce them all now. We have first Kartik Moralidaran, who is the Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of California in San Diego, and has really done uh, some uh, terrific empirical work on um, education in India. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Gunda Rao, who was until recently the director of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, knows more about public finance in India than probably anybody. He is a member of the um, 14th Finance Commission, as well as being on the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. And finally, we have Ashish Dawan, who comes from the private sector. He uh, founded his private equity firm, but then more recently is, has, is the CEO of the Central Square Foundation, which is a, a, a private um, uh, a, a firm that is investing in education. The backdrop to all of this is that between PESA and ASER, uh, the aggregate story is pretty clear, which is that the outlays have been going up and the outcomes are flat. Um, and there's been a lot of high quality empirical research over the past decade, uh, a lot of it conducted by people in this room. Um, and what was kind of a nice opportunity last year was to have a chance to synthesize all of this work in a background paper for the 12th plan. And some of that also showed up in, in a box in the economic survey this year. So this was kind of my attempt to try and put all of this together and say, let's synthesize what these messages are. And the good news is that you have seen significant improvements in every measure of input. So there's better infrastructure there's more toilets, there's more electricity, there's more road, road connectivity, there's more midday meals. Um, and the bad news is that none of this seems to have any correlation whatsoever with improved learning outcomes. Um, and we can do this much better than just the aggregate data. In Andhra Pradesh, we have five years of longitudinal data where we've tracked the same kids, 50,000 kids over five years. And so that allows us every year to look at what level of learning a child comes in with and what he leaves with every single year. So which constructs a statistical measure called a value add in our nationwide panel study of teacher absence I mean we see that all this improvement in infrastructure has no correlation whatsoever with reduced teacher absence the only thing that matters is improved monitoring and supervision right I mean and so th the positive news here is this is not fancy monitoring with a camera or like you know really or biometrics or all the fancy stuff it's just good old plain monitoring right I mean was your school visited by an inspector or a CRC or a BR like in the past three months and just having schools that have had this on a regular basis reduces the level is correlated with a reduction in the kind of unauthorized absence almost by half okay so it's just very simple stuff so the good news is that we have some ideas of basic things that work right so let's even assume that MHRD says fine we agree um, that learning outcomes is what we need to focus on do we have any idea of how to get there and do we have the capacity as a state to deliver on those outcomes and so to me the PESA report at, you know it's it's a classic case of leverage right because PESA is really covering only two percent of the annual education budget the bulk of the spending is teacher salaries right like I mean and the capital capital expenditure but the two percent gives you this wonderful lens into the the capacity of the system we need to govern and implement and so that's why I think when Yamini and I talked about this I mean we think about PESA really as kind of raising and making central um, this issue of state capacity so let me highlight some basic data from our new round of um, surveys that we did the most basic indicators, right? 20% of districts in our All India sample didn't have a DEO. The, the DEO post was vacant. The average tenure of a DEO is less than one year, right? I mean, how do you expect these guys to do anything? Like, I mean, if it takes three or four or six months to come up with a plan, you're gone by the time you have a chance to do this, right? So it's the most basic metrics of governance. Uh, basic monitoring right so where does the variation in these inspections come from it comes from a most basic level from staffing and it comes from who's monitoring the monitors right? and so the other main message coming from PESA is the importance of allowing much more space for local level innovation and autonomy and so the ideal structure here and Land Pritchett and I see Vada Pandey is here like I mean I've written this beautiful paper basically breaking down the education value chain by first principles of fiscal federalism in terms of what functions need to sit at a higher level of government what functions need to sit at a lower level. And that's a useful point at which to tee off to Professor Govindara. But I think the main point is that what you want to do in Delhi and at more centralized levels is things about the standards and the goals, but not kind of put states and districts and blocks in a straitjacket. This is exactly what you will do with your money. So part of this conversation about autonomy experimentation 
and empowerment has to involve greater fund flows, greater devolution, and holding entities accountable for outcomes. So, I mean, clearly we know that not all states handle their responsibilities well, but you want to kind of not go too far the other way in terms of putting people into a straitjacket. Um, and the second thing, you know, and I'll come back to this in the discussion, but, you know, since Ashish is here, I really wanted to tee up, like, I mean, a couple of important points, right? Like, I mean, if you look at management overall and think about what state capacity today, what we're lacking, it's fundamentally about systems and it's about people, right? Uh, and so Jack Welch, the CEO of GE, very famously said that he spent 70% of his time thinking about HR issues, right? I mean, that it was all about getting the right people and giving them their autonomy, but the right professional incentives over time uh, over which good performance would be rewarded. And so that's where these ideas of teacher performance measurement, management, career ladders, all of these come in. But I have no idea how to implement this, right? Like, I mean, I can sit uh, and kind of broadly say that we've done these experiments on performance pay, we've done these experiments on teacher contracting and found that they have a big, had made a big impact. And so what would be great is now to think about what are the entry points by which just better management practice uh, can be brought into government. So it's not fancy, it's just kind of plumbing, as uh, another famous guest here says, right? Like, I mean, it's getting the basic architecture of how the state functions, right? Um, and let me stop there. <laughs> let me, at the outset, compliment uh, Yamini and her team for this wonderful work. Um, I think this is uh, very important. There are very few attempts at uh, tracking expenditures, and this is one of those important initiatives to track uh, expenditures on elementary education, which is extremely important. Um, while I agree with the total, you know, overall uh, tenor of the report uh, and the thrust that it gives, one is there is a certain emphasis. In fact, it came out even in the talk that was this thing saying that oh, there has been a tremendous increase in outlays. I'm sorry, there hasn't been. You know, if you see, after the Right to Education Act was imposed, was brought in, you know, you have an increase of total expenditure of 22.8%. Now, this is in two years, which basically, you know, works out a, a little more than 11%, which is much less than the inflation rate that you have. And, and the GDP growth rate, you know, which is about the inflation rate that you have and the GDP growth. But if you take SSA in that, there has been an increase of 57.3%. But if you detect the SSA from the overall, the expenditure increase is just about 3.6%. Now, this, this is not just arithmetic. This is what we intergovernmental finance call the extent of substitution that takes place. And given the fact that the states are under tremendous pressure to contain their own fiscal deficits, they see that there is money coming from the center, so wherever they can cut down on the expenditure side elsewhere, they will, they will cut it down. The report rightly brings out that 61% goes into two major heads. Why? This is the education of the teachers, for the teachers, by the teachers. <laughs> the teachers and the contracts take the, the entire thing and the learning doesn't get any money. Now, not surprisingly, the, the results are what they are. The report brings out the excessive centralization in the system, which is an extremely important thing. If, you know, in the, again, in governmental finance, you have two major transfer systems. One is a general purpose transfer given to the states for meeting their fiscal disabilities. General fiscal disabilities, the general purpose transfer. The other one is a specific purpose transfer, which is given to ensure that in respect of some services, Minimum standards of, or minimum expenditures are definitely incurred. Minimum standards are ensured. Martin Feldstein calls them categorical equity goods. Now, these are the, the, the best design for that is to give them a specific purpose transfer, all right, with the broad this thing saying that this is for elementary education. With the matching requirements from the states, I mean, you can do it in an incremental manner so that it's at the margin, they don't reduce the expenditures. But then you keep it open-ended so that, and then matching ratios can vary across states. You don't have to have the same ratio because, you know, some states cannot really give the same matching requirement as others. Now, we don't really think about anything else. We want one size fits all, and we don't care whether there is a misallocation of resources, whether there is any, any whether our priorities, priorities are right, whether we really, have, you know, that leads to a ton, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, any innovation. 
you know, we are not concerned about it. We are concerned about the fact that we have this outlay. And there is a funny part between the difference between outlays and out uh, and uh, the expenditures. Difference comes from the fact that you see, if some state has not been able to give the utilization certificate by March 31st, you have a problem. If you don't give the utilization certificate, if you don't take the money, then the next year the budget will be cut. And therefore, what you do, you somehow, so the education department, what it does is it reallocates the expenditures to, the, reallocates the money to other states, which has given the, the, the utilization certificate. Then what is the purpose of original design? Where original design has been done on the basis of where, you know, you need more money. Expenditures are a necessary thing. But then they are not sufficient. You do need much more. And we need to find out what are those factors which actually determine the outcomes? What are the policies that can help in the outcomes? Of course, decentralization is important. Better design is important. But what additional factors that you need to really do in order to ensure learning the, the laudable objective which the 12th plan puts forth? Thank you. So as a corporate person, when I look at education, you know, we, when you run a company, I mean, you're relying on all kinds of data, but the data you really care about is outcome data. The outcome data in education, in my mind, is really learning outcome. And so we're measuring all these inputs, but we're really flying blind because we have no learning outcome data. And so I think when we're all talking about learning outcome, but what we really need is assessment. We need it ASAP because we can talk about learning assessment in the 12th plan, but if we don't have assessment, and I think we need assessment for every child, not a sample, class three, class seven, class, uh, class three, class five, class seven, class nine, at regular frequency. I think Kartik pointed out that the central government's role really is, should be focused around standards and goals. Um, as I looked at the data, our central government uh, 10 years ago spent about 14% of the overall spend on education. Central government spend in India has gone up 6x over the last decade. And so I think this, what the center needs to ask is how is it spending its money and what mechanism can it use to actually hold the states accountable because that's really their role. So I think we need to really think about mechanisms that the center can use with their money power. If you're spending 25% of the money, you ought to be able to demand accountability. Human capital is at the absolute core. This is a human capital-based uh, space. The quality of our teachers, the quality of our school leaders, the quality of our administrators is what will make the real difference at the end of the day. But I think one area we've ignored has been headship or school leadership. Um, the way we select our principals or headmasters how can we bring about change in that selection process and really investing in better school leadership, which the country has not done. Uh, and then lastly, I know the, the PESA report clearly uh, plays a very important role. In, as Kartik said, even though it may represent only 2% of the overall spend, it really shows us how inefficient uh, state capacity is. And so it's the whole principle of uh, autonomy for accountability. So we should start sending more money down as we can start to hold them more accountable. And accountable really based on learning outcomes. Thank you very much.